Exactly. Uh, no matter how many conferences we do, it's a clear sign. We will always. <laughs> we need to renovate the mandate of the IGF. That's a clear sign for that. So anyway, uh, Michele, you know, you're gonna be the moderator, so it doesn't matter if you yes, say yes, um, or not. You're not missing much. Um, I will. Uh, things work now, so I just let you kick off the session. Um, okay, just just uh, for for me to understand um, about the audience in the room is uh, is Evelyn there as well, or other participants or actors from the IGF. So we can engage with them. <laughs> there are a f there are there are people here in the room, of course. Um, not a big number, I would say, but uh, they are the more motivated. So no worries. Of course, Evelyn is okay. here. So okay, one of the of the of the speaker uh, is here definitely, and. Uh, Yes, so you can and you can kick off the session. Again. Okay, another uh, question: uh, Can you see us or uh, see if we share slides? We do see uh, the Zoom session really well. Okay, and your face is so... really really big on the screen. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, I, we can ask if you can also give me share sharing rights on Zoom. Maybe I can share a few slides. Uh, Otherwise, you know, we will do without it. But uh, at the moment, my screen sharing is disabled. So if you could also give me the screen sharing, um, give, make me co-host or something. It's okay, happening. it's happening. Great. So welcome, everybody. It's good to have you here. We cannot see you, uh, see your face. Uh, we have a few online participants as well. Uh, I think that those are, that are here are curious to learn more about what is Peace Tech, which is a a trending uh, word um, going around now in the peace building and peace tech area. Uh, I see Uma shared a document. I will uh, introduce uh, these uh, two um, speakers here on screen uh, in a second. But uh, before, um, I will also like to uh, thank you, thanks, uh, thank the IGF for this opportunity to speak about this. It will be uh, a rather informal session. So it would be nice to engage with you uh, in Addis, in Addis as well. Uh, of course, it's a bit challenging as we don't see you, uh, but p please feel free to take the microphone and and, and speak to us because um, the most important part is you know to also get questions from the audience and and engage. So I will start uh, with this session on on global peace tech um, and the global peace tech atlas. And uh, I'm Michele Giovanardi from the European University Institute, and I'm the coordinator of the Global Peace Tech Hub, which is a quite uh, recent initiative that we launched here in Florence uh, at the School of Transnational Governance. And we have two uh, core partners, which are the uh, New York University, the Governance Lab, here represented by UMA. I don't know if you can see her. And we also have another core partner, which is the University of Lucerne Institute of Social Ethics, uh, which is represented by Evelyn Tauschnitz, uh, which should be in the room. Um, so I don't know, Evelyn, if you can hear, hear us. Uh, hi. So I will uh, start by giving you, um, if you agree, uh, a brief introduction on what is uh, the global uh, Peace Tech Hub and what is Peace Tech. And uh, I then will um, give the floor to Uma uh, to explain a little bit um, what we realize in terms of mapping peace tech as a topic. Uh, and then uh, I will leave it to Evelyn for an overview on uh, the ethical uh, global peace tech uh, ethics and human rights. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so there's a comment from the audience. Uh, um, if you like to use captions, please uh, use the link just posted in the chat. So there we go. I will share a few slides with you. Please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, otherwise, I will feel very lonely uh, here on the screen. So yeah, uh, I also, um, Calypso Nicolaitis, Professor of Global Affairs, uh, also is also sending her regards, uh, but he couldn't be here with us today. So the global peace tech. Uh, so technology uh, uh, is getting into the news for for bad reasons today, and and we know that uh, 
technology can be weaponized in different ways. Here is just some a few screenshots for, for from last week, uh, talking about how technology was weaponized in, in Ukraine and has become uh, an, yet another tool of power politics and power competition. And you know, even internet here is the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, there were there were big hopes uh, of of uh, using the internet as a dem democratizing tool, uh, a tool that uh, would drive uh, peace, would drive um, social cohesion. But we soon realized that uh, that wasn't the case. And with with the few scandals uh, about misuse of data uh, from social media but also about the spread of fake news, junk news, misinformation, disinformation, and uh, the use of deep fake, deep fake or, or the internet uh, to achieve, um, to achieve uh, from groups, or, for instance, to recruit um, organized terror, ter terrorist attacks. So we were quite hopeful, uh, and then it turns, turned out to be something bad. And we, we were quite aware of that here at the Internet Govern Governance Forum. But that is, that's not the case only for the internet. Any other emerging technology, uh, we can see a similar trend in, in AI, in, in blockchain, in, in space technology. Um, so we see that this common trend of technical we weaponization is something that, that looks like uh, it, it can feel like something that is unavoidable, and uh, and there is quite a lot of interest about this. So technology is not this a driver of uh, peaceful globalization, but yet another uh, things that divide us. So Mark Leonard, for instance, in his book uh, on the age of one piece, is is saying that. Uh, uh, connectivity instead of bringing us together is, is, is in fact tearing us apart. But is this the end of the story? And we don't think so. Uh, we think that uh, technology can, can also be used, of course, for peaceful purposes. And uh, that can be at many different levels. And peace technology technology has been, used, has been used for peace and peace building quite effectively in the last 10, 15, 20 years. And we actually realized that many organizations um, are labeling the same, themselves as peace tech organizations. And they run quite a lot of projects around the world in the global south as well on the user, using technology to achieve peace building purposes. So that's something that it's, it's already there and it's happening. But what's the problem? The problem is that for any given technology, you can achieve a lot in terms of peace building, uh, but you also have risks risks and dangers. So we try to capture this dynamic in what we call the, the tipping model. This idea that uh, technology is, uh, of course, starts with, with something that has, has positive purpose and then is, is used and misused uh, to achieve something negative. And we're, we're trying to study and, and reflect on how we can make it uh, tip back or avoid uh, technology uh, to tip uh, on, on the on the wrong side. And for, for any kind of technology, you have this duality. So I was talking about the hopes of internet and online disinformation, but also the opportunities of blockchain and digital identities with migration, with many different applications I, I can talk about, uh, versus uh, privacy and data ownership uh, issues. We have uh, a chance for empathy building, telepresence, and trust building with social media, but this becomes a, a vehicle, deep fake, hate speech, online violence that turns into physical violence. We have apps for and data for early warning and response system, but they are also used for surveillance, surveillance capitalism. We have the Internet of Things, but also this comes with uh, with increase also vulnerabilities uh, of cyber attacks. So you see this balance. And the question is, how do we um, how do we uh, what 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 do we do? How do we make the model tip to the positive side? And it's a challenge that um, it is also uh, it is a regulation challenge, of course, but it's also um, a challenge that uh, it needs to start from regulation and and, and policy innovation, but also it needs to go, to go um, towards promoting a different culture on how these uh, means uh, and technologies are used. And at the end of the day, also it has also to do with the shifting investments from technology, military technologies to uh, these projects that are leveraging technology for good. Uh, so, but before going to that, um, you might wonder what is peace tech? Maybe I will leave this to Uma. Here is a very scary uh, slide with a lot of examples. Uh, but it's something I can also share with you if you're interested. Uh, uh, we are putting together 
a, a global peace tech atlas with case studies and initiatives on the use of technology for good. So that's something we are currently doing and we will publish soon in the coming month. And uh, our team worked on a mapping, on a big mapping, huge mapping. We have a physical map that we will show you now uh, with different uh, cases uh, all around the world. And we are also uh, crowdsourcing this information, asking uh, different uh, think, think tanks and research institutes to contribute to the mapping. So peace tech uh, is a technology used for peace, and we try to define uh, peace tech. And there are many definitions out there. The definition that we give uh, is the following one. So uh, a field of analysis uh, applied to all processes connecting local and global practices aimed at achieving social and political peace through the responsible use of frontier technology. So our definition is quite kind of inclusive definition, which is not just about the internet, but all kind of uh, uh, frontier technologies, disrupting technology um, that, um, that connect people uh, at the local and global uh, level. And so for us, global peace tech uh, is um, kind of a new field where we're trying to put together global affairs and, and global studies uh, um, with uh, more practical uh, studies and work uh, in, in the peace field. And we try to study this on a global perspective because this uh, use of technology for peace um, raises a lot of questions, you know, who are the actors involved, a question about power concentrations uh, and, and different level of, of governance. So I, I will try to to be short, not to take uh, too much space from the other speakers as well. But of course, this is a, an interdisciplinary endeavor. And uh, we thought about this in three steps. So the first step was the mapping. So to try to like have a bird, bird eye view on what is going on in the field of peace tech. And we did that, that in collaboration with the Governance Lab for, from New York University. And uh, it, it was both a topic mapping, but also a mapping of peace tech initiatives, thanks uh, also to Lucia Bozoer, which is uh, on screen here, working at the European University Institute uh, in different projects that are related to tech and, and governance, uh, tech and policy. The second step would be after this first step, an assessment of these peace technologies. So yeah, to understand what works, what doesn't work. Um, and the third step uh, would be policy recommendation. Um, so today we are looking at the Atlas, so at the first step. So I will now give immediately the floor uh, to Uma to kind of, um, bring us into uh, the mapping uh, of peace tech as a topic. And, and then maybe to Lucia, if she can co if she can connect and share, or I can also share um, the, this mapping that we've done and, and a few thoughts on how we developed it. And then I will get back the floor for just a few uh, couple of words on the step two and step three. And, and then I will give the floor to Evelyn uh, for a reflection on, on ethics. When I was talking about uh, the responsible use, and I will close it here, uh, you might wonder what is responsible use? What is this word responsible? I mean, you can interpret this in different ways. So it's very important that we agree uh, on basic core principles uh, that for Evelyn, I know uh, are uh, human rights, which is a framework that is already there and to kind of mainstream these into the design of technological applications with principles and, and with, the, with the questions that the, the designers or, or um, yeah, the developers are embedding into their, the design process. So uh, let's start. I will give the floor to, to, to Uma for, uh, for the mapping. Please tell me if you can share. Otherwise, I will try to share the slides for you. Yeah, I don't have um, screen share uh, permission, but I've sent over the slides. Okay. Good. So I think you can easily share those. So uh, now it's a problem oh. on my side. I don't find this. Ah, okay. You said it. Okay. I got it. I, I got it. <laughs> okay. Great. No worries. Okay. Well, um, all right, let's just let it load up. 
and hopefully everyone can see. Thank you again, Michele, for this uh, very good introduction into what is Peace Tech and our topic mapping. And I'm just going to walk a little bit through what we did as a group at the Governance Lab. So um, one of our research methodologies is called uh, creating a topic map, which is a very broad um, and rapid scan of the field and what is kind of out there, uh, what exists, what doesn't exist in order to figure out what are the, you know, cardinal directions with a really uh, big topic like Peace Tech and then figuring out um, who's already working in the spaces, what are the uh, applications that exist and uh, what also is kind of not in order to really gauge where research can take place in order to allow for uh, a taxonomy for further uh, kind of, you know, uh, review um, and really pave the way from going from a topic map to a very active actor mapping. Um, so I'll spare you the details of our methodology. Um, kind of, you know, jumping off of what Michele said, we really look at uh, peace tech as technology uh, that is really there to support positive peace over long and short-term horizons. And one of the main things that we found was that most instances of peace tech are dual use. So they have the potential to do both harm as well as uh, good. Really look at the institutional and governance structures around them in order to help steer them more towards the good rather than the bad. Um, and so this is extremely important nowadays, as we're seeing with the current conflicts and the way that technology uh, is being used and, and manipulated in order to uh, egg on conflict. And from this, what we did was we really looked at first the difference between military tech and then peace tech, and we found that there is a distinction between how uh, the, how technology is being discussed in literature, and that for the most part, people discuss the negative aspects or the more offensive aspects of technology when it's used in a conflict setting, more so than actually looking at, well, how can technology enable peace and enable uh, conflict resolution and building. And so from there, what we did was looked at four kind of factors, which was, you know, number one, what are the technologies that are being used for peace and by whom? What are the cur current use cases and uh, ap practical applications? And we then created a classification uh, of the, you know, most recent uh, kind of spread of uh, different uh, technology across six different fields that I'll get to in a second. And then we considered what are the challenges and further considerations for peace researchers. Um, and now going from there, what we really found was within the space, one way of categorizing it was to look at the physical tech tools and then the digital with a caveat that these two have a lot of overlap and that there's a lot of blending uh, involved. And from there, what we also did was we really looked at what are the cases across uh, different uh, categories and gave some practical, tangible examples, as shown here. Um, from there, what we did was we looked at these kind of six categories of peace tech. And now these categories were chosen because they kept coming up when we we're doing our research of these natural kind of, um, you know, uh, headings that are coming up with all of the different work that is out there. We looked at different uh, tools and techniques that are being used, uh, such as, you know, the conflict change map, uh, news trackers, disinformation trackers, AI, um, algorithms that are being used to monitor migration flows and to check to see if uh, uh, news is uh, verified or if it is more on the side of disinformation. Um, we really looked at also uh, kind of what are these what are these tools uh, within the context of the Russia Ukraine conflict and how they are being deployed right now, and from this look at what's already been done or is being done, we then looked at what are the challenges and risks that are uh, emerging that policymakers and researchers need to consider. And one of the primary ones was, as I said before, this dual use nature that allows for tech to be used as an instrument of good in order to, you know, build uh, relationships between different groups of people or for uh, more bad to sow seeds of misinformation and distrust. Uh, as well, we looked at the way that data in itself can be weaponized within the wrong hands 
And we also looked at what current international uh, regulations are uh, doing in order to help promote peace tech. And we found that there is a lot of um, kind of outdatedness of current systems that need to be uh, really enhanced for the 21st century and for modern day peace tech. We also looked at this growing phenomenon of private sectors, uh, you know, creating their own rules in order to govern their uh, technology and what are kind of the risks and the merits of that. Here, we really looked at, you know, this whole gamut of uh, considerations that led us to show that we need to really look at the governance of these technologies and we have to have it uh, meet to the demand for the existing demand in order to really address this dual use of uh, peace tech tools. And from here, we've created this topic map. You can uh, see it on the uh, Global Peace Tech Hub website. And um, the next kind of step is to know what are the areas that we've missed? Where should we kind of uh, put more focus into? What are things on this map that aren't there but should be there uh, in order to then go into our next stage of really building this next uh, new generation research agenda to help uh, get a really holistic and clear understanding of where is Peace Tech now and where is it going? And so with that, I will pass the floor back over to Michele. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your overview. And uh, actually, I haven't introduced you, but uh, Uma properly, but Uma is a research assistant at the Gov Governance Lab. Uh, and uh, she worked on this with Stefan Verhulst, uh, which is a co-founder of the Governance Lab. And Uma is also Strategy and Innovation Director of 18 by Vote, uh, a youth-led nonprofit uh, organization that helps um, 16, 17, and 18 years old understand how to vote, when to vote, and why to vote. So there's also something that uh, you you might want to explore. And um, and yeah, she also mentioned the the website of this initiative. It's globalpeacetech.com. Sorry, that org. So if you want to, uh, you can also easily access more information more information about the session, and it's also in the chat. Um, so just a, a few words uh, um, on, on this uh, mapping that uh, Uma was uh, referring to. And I will just share um, my screen for a second and show you um, this physical map that, we've di that we did uh, before leaving the floor to Evelyn. So as you can see here, uh, the Global Peace Tech map uh, took the shape of a, a physical map. This is a, a collaborative map on a tool called Padlet. So everybody can access uh, when we had, uh, let's say the choice uh, on what tool to use, we opted for this tool because it's very easy to use and everybody can easily add uh, a Peace Tech uh, initiative to this map. So the idea of the map is to really get uh, this overview of what is going on there. Uh, but uh, of course, we want to build on these and, and, and to expand these to include more and more initiatives. And the way we did it is that at the Master of Transnational Governance that we have at the School of Transnational Governance at the UI in Florence, we identified different students that were uh, from different parts of the world, including China and Asia, uh, North America, South America, Africa, Europe. So we try to cover a lot of countries uh, and, and try to overcome the language barrier. And we started to map these initiatives by, by technology and also type of peace. So as I was saying before, we, we're not excluding any kind of technologies, but also uh, we created a categorization of um, peace. So peace in the short term, peace in the long term. And uh, we have both short term uses of technology to promote peace building, peacekeeping, but also long term uh, peace, positive, what is called uh, sometimes positive peace. And there uh, we use some pillars of positive peace. So um, here in the map, you can get this overview. This is of course something, a starting point it is not complete, but it's uh, you can find there a great uh, example of what we mean by peace tech. And you can also contribute to it uh, by clicking on this uh, plus button and inserting the location and uh, the link and the description of the initiatives, um, the initiative, and this will need, need to be approved to, uh, to filter this uh, against uh, spam. 
but uh, nevertheless, it's a good way of keeping in touch. And also when we go to people that don't know what P-Stack is, uh, they can immediately uh, have a, a first first contact and first example. Um, so now I would like to give the floor to Evelyn um, to talk a little bit more about um, Global Peace Tech in relation um, to ethics and human rights. And Dr. Dr. Evelyn uh, Tochnitz is Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Social Ethics, uh, University of Lucerne, uh, where she exp she's exploring the impact of the digital transformation on peace and war from an ethics and human rights point of view. Uh, so Evelyn, I will leave uh, the floor to you. I hope you're there. Uh, I now, oh, I can see you. Wow, that's great. We made great progresses. Okay, great. I cannot hear you though, yeah. Hello, hello. Ah, now it's working. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Michele, for that um, great introduction and also um, for that peace tech mapping. I know there's that's been lots of work, and uh, thank you, Uma, also for um, for showing us what has been done in this mapping. I'm gonna not go deeper into that one, but I actually want to look more at the ethics and human rights perspective, and also talk a bit more uh, what we actually mean by peace tech. So um, that would probably fit in the second or third step that Michaela mentioned. Like the first is the mapping, then analyzing, and also um, the question like about governance, like what we should be doing. So I'm gonna start with the, <laughs> well, okay, quick overview. I'm gonna first talk about technology and peace very quickly, how they are intermined, then defining peace. And if we define peace, we should also define what is violence. Um, I'm going to talk about freedom as an expression of peace, human rights that I would advocate to as an ethical minimal standard if we talk about what is peace tech, because it's a big question. I mean, what is peace tech? Everybody talks about it, but it's not really clear. Uh, if we have time, I um, can quickly mention some governance strategies and um, then the summary. What should peace tech aim for, really? And it's a should because I'm, I'm from ethics, while well, my background is also political science, I've also worked in human rights law, but um, right now I'm in ethics, so it's, um, really, the co it's really a bit the question. Um, we see what is out there, like with the mapping, we see these different initiatives. We also know what are the risks, or we gonna analyze it even more in that, but there are certain risks that have been mentioned already. Also, there are lots of opportunities to peace tech, and now given this, um, scenario like the question is really what we should be doing not really the how but also about the what so so yes technology and peace they're very closely um, related because peace uh, well it's a very elastic concept people talk peace and they often make war so we have to first about think what we understand by peace if we want to know what is peace tech Technology is a very powerful magnifier. It also uh, reallocates power relationships in society. And it really um, depends what we, how we define peace and what values also we consider building blocks of peace when we want to, when you want to distin distinguish between peaceful and violent uses of technologies. So the titles, are, I think, are not visible. But anyway, it's about uh, defining peace. That's the, that slide. Um, the definition given by John Galton, he was a pioneer in peace research. That's a quite well-known one, is that peace is the absence of violence. Negative peace, um, no direct violence. That means the violence that is observable from person to person, that you could actually be um, like recording with a video camera, for example. Positive peace is the absence of structural and cultural violence. So structural violence, um, well, that's really the violence that is embedded in the structure, in the system. Means, for example, um, inequality in socioeconomic relationships. Means um, also kind of uh, things that are not directly attributable to one person. Like it's difficult to pinpoint the responsibility, who is responsible for it, but still there is some form of violence. That is very connected to the cultural violence, that is the legitimization of direct and structural violence. Like a prominent example there is gender discrimination. So if um, 
if, for example, women are not allowed to participate in political life, that would be some kind of structural violence that is legitimized through the cultural violence, like saying that women should be doing this or not be doing that. So peace is the absence of direct structural and cultural violence, we can say. And some uh, short observations, like they're closely interlinked, these um, forms, they're not uh, separated, but they tend to occur together. From a realist point of view, there's always some sort of violence, like we are daily victims of violence, so to say. We're never going to have um, completely peaceful societies, but uh, peace will always remain a vision. But still, it's very important to have that vision because we want to know where we're going. We want to have some kind of compass, we need a direction. We want to know if we have governance strategies for what are these governance strategies. Like we should be knowing where we're heading to, where we want to be heading to. So, um, and peace can provide us with that vision. Not the only one, but it's an important vision, I believe. So if we define peace as the absence of violence, we should also be thinking for a second, what is violence? And uh, Galton himself has defined that as the cause of the difference between the potential and the actual. Sounds complicated, it's quite simple. So the actual is what the person I am and the circumstances I'm living in. The potential is the person I could be and the circumstances I could be living in if there were no violence. If we take the example of um, women, for example, who are discriminated, maybe a girl cannot go to school because she's experienced this kind of cultural and structural violence, so she might not reach her full potential. Even if she is extremely smart, she might still end up not having a job at all or doing some kind of job that does not match her potential. So there we experience some, some kind of violence there. It's a structural cultural violence in that sense, but it's still there. Another prominent example is, um, for example, if there's no good health system, then a person may not enjoy the same, same health as if that services would be available. That's also some kind of violence. If we think about then what, um, what peace really would mean, if we would have absolute positive peace, we're never going to have that because peace is a, is a vision. But if it would exist, hypothetically, it would mean that there would be no difference between the potential and the actual. But I could actually choose in freedom who I want to be and choose the life I would want to live. But, there's an important but, I would still need to respect, have respect for the equal freedom of others. And that's extremely important if we talk about peace and war. So it's not this kind of um, freedom, I do whatever I want and I take the power and so on. But it's rather responsible freedom, like respecting also the rights of others. Mm, let's go on. So in absolute peace, you would ha really have equal opportunities and freedom for all to realize their full potential. But this also has a negative and positive, um, again, a negative and positive aspect of freedom. The negative freedom, it relates really closely to civil and political rights. It's the omission of actions that restrict freedoms. Positive freedom is um, like what I'm free to do in that sense. It depends also on possibilities and capabilities. Like if I don't have the possibility due to structural violence, so then I'm not free to do something. Just um, briefly as well, possibilities, these are mainly defined by the structural and cultural violence we find in society. Capabilities are by nature not equally distributed in, uh, in society. But um, really it's also closely connected to responsibility because as I said, the limits of my freedom is the freedom of others. What's also key if we talk about um, peace is that um, even if there would be peace in the sense of structural peace or cultural peace, some people might still not have the capa capacities to make full use of the opportunities that are provided to them because they are maybe sick, because they might be old, children also, so then they need more. They don't only need freedom, but they also need to be take, they, they need care, they need solidarity. Not to reach maybe their full potential, but at least to live a life in solidarity and human dignity. So I would advocate there that we really do also want human dignity as an unconditional baseline. And as a matter of fact, human dignity is both a core value of peace and human rights. 
So peace tech should not only promote peace for the powerful, but also a peace for everyone, and especially for those also who need special support and assistance. Human rights. So, as I said, the values of freedom and human dignity, they're both shared, of uh, peace and human rights. And that's um, not coincidence, but I mean that uh, his both historically, that's grounded after the Second World War, and also conceptually. Because it's very difficult to imagine peace without human rights, and also vice versa. Like in, in when we have war, mostly human rights are not respected anymore. Yeah, just uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where we will know all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And that includes both civil and political rights and also economic, social, and cultural rights. So I would advocate for human rights as an ethical minimal standard for peace and peace tech. And um, really to create the, the social economic conditions that also allow the, the weak or the, um, the people who do not have the power to live uh, a life in human dignity. And peace tech should thus also empower marginalized groups and make really give them the freedom to take their own, to make their own choices. So that is a bit more about the process. Like it shouldn't be peace tech from above, but from bottom up and participatory. Let's see how much time I have left. Okay, still a bit. So human rights, just briefly also some advantages. I mean, they're not only moral norms, but they're also legally. I mean, that's an important point where they have um, certain mechanisms in place. They um, already universally recognized, always not al also not always implemented. But um, there are certain mechanisms. We don't have to start from scratch. And also, we can already build on existing networks. Um, outlook governance strategies, like why is governance so important? I think I should talk about it actually because we are here at the Internet Governance Forum. <laughs> so that makes sense, yes. We are at the Internet Governance Forum, so let's look, let's look at it. The, so governance really is important both for, um, it's kind of obvious, for, but for promoting the, the good stuff and addressing the risks. And um, that's my personal research question there. What governance strategies should be adopted to promote and safeguard peace and human well-being in the digital age? So either we can promote the good things, uh, the peace tech, that's, uh, that has been mentioned before. Like all, It's not only about looking at the risks, but also what my colleagues have done, also mapping really what kind of good initiatives are out there that are using technology to promote peace. Also, it might make sense to simply ban certain technologies or do or make a moratorium, at least on them, till they are, um, how to say, till they can be like properly regulated. Because many technologies, it's difficult to regulate them because either there's not the knowledge yet of the policy makers or they create facts by themselves very quickly. <laughs> like the, the technology is developing quicker than, than the regulation. So it might make sense to do a moratorium and say, okay, they're not, um, they're not allowed for, for or their application is not allowed till we have regulated them properly. Or simply regulate these, um, as has been said also, these dual use, uses of technology. And possible means self-regulation might work for some cases, like for example, platforms, economic and financial incentives is always worth a try. Nudging has not been explored so much. If it would work, that would be awesome because it could really, um, it would um, provide, incent not incentives, but it, it would kind of push people to do the right thing by altering the environment. I mean, the, the, um, the, um, the most common example is there if you enter a shop and before you go out, there's always the, the candies. Like while you're in the waiting line, the candies are there and nobody pushes you to take the candies. But uh, people who have children, they know it's quite likely that the children will take the candies. Not because anybody pushes them to, but because they're placed in a way that it's the most likely outcome. So we could maybe be thinking also, how can we use technologies to nudge peace? Why not? And legally binding norms. I mean, at least for um, the most stressing problems, it might even be worth to be thinking if we should build on old norms, like all existing human rights, or if we rather want new norms. In, for example, a UN convention, do we need that? Or 
a diff like a way in between could also be like we need a new international agreement on how to interpret human rights, for example, because these are like understood also quite differently by different actors in different contexts, what it means to apply human rights online. So that's the summary at the end. So what should global peace tech aim for? It should reduce any all types of violence, human rights as an ethical minimal standard, um, personal freedom, I think is civil and political rights is an important one, especially when we talk about surveillance technologies, for example. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's key for peace, let's say it that way. Without civil and political rights, it's very difficult to have situations of peace. And create equal opportunities also for all to realize their full potential. Human dignity as an unconditional baseline. I mean, human dignity is key of human rights and, and peace, both of it. And ideally also empower marginalized communities really to make their own choices and to, to do that in a bottom-up approach. Yeah, that's now really the last one. Okay, so if we look at, if there's some kind of ethical assessment that we could be thinking for, for peace tech, um, really the baseline is that certain technologies are developed and used with certain intentions for certain purposes by certain actors and they produce certain co impacts and consequences. And that's important if we talk about responsibility. So if something goes wrong, somebody has to be responsible. And well, that's really kind of based on, um, on the three main ethical strands, but I don't want to go in depth here now. Yeah. Um, Evelyn, we was also want to, we have five minutes left, okay, so we also want, one. I'm yeah. Gonna, I'm going to end okay. here. I'm going to end. It's the last one. But I think it's okay. really important to look like what are, for what purposes our technologies are developed, because if they're developed for military purposes, it's already difficult to combine with the ethical human rights perspective. And then um, secondly, are they in accordance with human rights norm? And what are the consequences of certain technologies being applied? Thank you very much. Also, thank you, Michele, for your patience. No, thank you so much. Uh, of course, she was talking about the patient with the technology that uh, didn't work at the beginning of the session, not about the patient for, patient for the presentation, which uh, was great. And um, thank you so much for this overview on the ethical minimum standards and also to um, to provide us this um, glimpse into the the governance options, the governance idea, and I think it's uh, it's very important for us at least uh, to think about this. Uh, it's the core of our reflection. It's the end game for us. So about this this whole initiative. So uh, how do we govern this? Uh, what what can we do with the regulation? Uh, so we think a lot about policy innovation while. Being aware that it's not this is not the end of the story, and regulation will not it's not a magic wound. Uh, but then you need also to promote a culture uh, in which um, this regulation can be applied. But anyway, I was just wanted to check if this, this were, uh, there were any questions from the audience there um, or uh, audience online. So yeah, there's a question. Thank you. So Sorry, much. we talked too much. We didn't leave uh, enough space for you. <laughs> I'm not sure whether, yeah. okay, now it works. Uh, hi there, uh, my name is Eliška Pirkova. I work as Global Freedom of Expression Lead at Access Now. And this was really fascinating presentation, well, all of them, um, and great opportunity for us to become more familiar with this great project, uh, since we've been also working on platforms accountability and content governance in times of crisis. So I do have several questions. I try to keep it brief in case someone else has also questions, but um, when you open your presentation, and I'm very happy that the last speaker actually elaborated on it because there was a long list of different technologies and different issues. And at some point I felt that maybe, uh, and I know that was just probably an example of all issues on the list, but. Uh, it was almost like mixing together weaponization of tech together with weaponization of information. And also, of course, uh, and I'm happy that the question of ban and moratorium on certain, on certain technologies uh, have been brought up because, of course, these technologies are very different in nature. So what will apply to content recommender systems or content moderation algorithms and what kind of measures we can adopt there in order to positively impact peace in the future will be defi definitely different than, for instance, spyware and Pegasus and uh, something that should be uh, outlawed or strictly regulated. And that brings me sort of to a second point, which is what is exactly a peace tech? Um, 
because to me, if we put aside a very concrete examples that are clearly used for military purposes, um, then we also end up, based on your presentation with tech such as, again, content recommender systems or ad delivery systems and the way how we optimize algorithms. And these exist whether there is a piece or word because they are an integral part of the business model of these platforms. So indeed, their harm, let's say societal harm or systemic risks, uh, are much more dangerous and visible in times of in instability and crisis. Um, but at the same time, perhaps there might be even a more systemic approach how to regulate them, and those examples now exist also in different jurisdictions predom predominantly in the EU. Um, so whether you factor this in that actually this information spreads online due to certain type of technologies, not only it's a societal phenomena first and foremost, but the consequences of it are much worse in times of war or, or open conflict. Um, and then maybe in that context, I would be also interested whether since you know we are in Ethiopia, whether you are also looking into issues around internet shutdowns, um, which has far reaching consequences, especially in times of conflict and war. Um, and then maybe last point would be, uh, so I'm not exactly sure how useful I mean, I totally understand the point, but we spend a lot of time, especially during our work in Brussels on different EU files, not to mix human rights with ethics. Um, and as much as I, I understand that this might be just a misunderstanding and we didn't have time to go more into it, um, but human rights are legally binding standards uh, that are also uh, either through positive obligation or through United Nations guiding principle in one way or another, let's say binding for private actors. Um, and this is pretty much why we now have also the set of due diligence safeguards that will be mandatory for those platforms and they are extremely relevant, especially during the time of crisis. So I would be interested in whether the project also takes that direction. Um, I'm sorry that was too long and thank you so much for this presentation. Well, thank you for, for these questions, uh, which are very relevant. I, I don't know if we can go a little bit over time in answering because it's already uh, 4.20, but it was, we also started 10, 15 minutes late. So maybe we can try to start answer that. And of course, uh, Uma and other speakers, feel free uh, to to add to, to my answer. I will also try to be very brief, but uh, hopefully we can continue this conversation um, after this session as well and uh, in other uh, spaces or uh, another time. Can but I, uh, first of can I, yeah. can I stop you? I mean, I, I would like to, maybe if, in case there are other questions, I would collect a few more questions eventually, just in case you see. So better to collect all the questions, otherwise are we gonna- Okay, ask? do you come forward? We can go a little bit over time because it's already 21. Yes, yes just a second. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, one just one small question. Um, uh, George Terzis from the Prague University of Brussels. I uh, just wanted to ask you if your research includes impact assessments actually of these technologies, um, because maybe I missed it, but I didn't see anything about impact assessments and uh, if you could say something about that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Other, Other questions? questions? Very relevant question. Other questions from the audience? No, so you can uh, you can move on with, uh, with uh, your short answers. Yeah, yeah. Um, short um, answers, feel free. Somebody from the online participants. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody from online that wants to jump in? I don't think it's the case. Let's try to answer that from, from online and from the room as well, Andrea and Evelyn. Uh, Andrea Calderaro, sorry, uh, I haven't introduced you, but it's part of the Global Peace Tech uh, Hub as well, uh, in particular with the project on, on Global South. So feel free to reply as well. But what I will say very briefly is that uh, Peace Tech uh, is a uh, is a field and a definition and we think of course there are specific set challenges to each specific technology but uh, the idea is that uh, uh, some of uh, uh, the use of, of this the use of this technology uh, for war or for peace or or anyway the social impacts uh, impact of this technology um, raises um, common challenges that uh, needs to be studied from a, a global affairs or IR perspective. IR maybe is not correct because uh, that's not it. I mean, it's an interdisciplinary approach, but many of these questions uh, are interconnected and uh, needs to be studied uh, together in our opinion. That's why we're trying to um, 
to shape this as a global peace tech hub and a global peace tech. And if you want like more details about what kind of questions we are thinking of when we, we say that, you can go to this uh, framework uh, paper that we published and I will share it and, and, and provide the link um, that uh, uh, that also has like five different examples of, of on, on areas uh, with the... Uh, uh, um, dozens of questions on where uh, we can study this, how we can study this from a global affairs perspective. So that's uh, about uh, about the approach, but also, of course, is it something that is under definition? So you ask, what is peace tech? And we just had a conference uh, on Monday, last Monday and Tuesday, and uh, we spent hours discussing what what is peace tech. So each organization was coming with uh, its own idea. And um, and of course, uh, there was a definition that uh, I provided um, before. Uh, that's our definition, but it's not like set in stone. Uh, it's something that we are discussing and, and currently uh, develop, developing. But of course, uh, this includes what you were talking about. So this kind of idea of embedding uh, peace by design uh, when we uh, think of technological applications uh, for peace and um, and yeah, having uh, a more systemic when we were talking about having a more systemic approach in regulation, uh, that's uh, obviously part of it. Um, so I know it's a, quite an incomplete answer, but uh, I would need to open many files to to answer that on impact assessment. That's step two. So when I was this is quite a recent project. We started in December and we committed to the mapping. And the, the next step, as you can see, is a uh, assessment, and the th only the third part goes to the policy recommendation. So when we do assessment, we want to evaluate um, tech use, uh, so on the technical level, but also tech users, users, so how they are affected by technology. And and the third step is a uh, tech regulation, so which kind of uh, um, uh, legal normative framework we can have. Um, to minimize the risks and enhance um, the opportunities that these uh, technologies offer. I realize this is uh, quite an incomplete answer, but again, it's impossible. I would need to talk more. <laughs> and uh, But basically, yeah, I, I will point you to this uh, paper that we wrote with Professor Khalid Nicolaitis uh, when we um, expand on these ideas and uh, kind of defend the idea of having a global peace tech as a as a common approach for for common questions that um, are affecting our time and need to be uh, taken into consideration together and not in silos in order to have uh, more peaceful and and societies and societies that you uh, leverage technology for good. So that's oh, I hope uh, a way of answering this question. But I leave it also to Uma, Andrea, and Evelyn. Uh, especially on the human rights versus ethics. I can really quickly answer a couple of questions from our first uh, um, uh, questioner. Um, really looking at you know this idea of as conflict arises, this uh, the use of technology uh, in in order to fuel that conflict arises as well. And that was actually a really big main theme that we found in the Peace Tech Talk Map, which was the dual use nature of um, the technology. And so something that needs to be considered is kind of what fail safes and governance kind of um, methods are in place so that way, even when there is unrest uh, politically, socially, the technology that is there is being manipulated. Um, also to the question about the impact assessments. So we look at kind of how the technology is being used and what are kind of the results of that. We looked at also um, a bit of what is the existing legislation and standardization kind of uh, methods. And one of the big findings we found was that it's not standardized. Um, it's really difficult to track how uh, peace tech has had an impact because the metrics are not um, you know, really, there, 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 there's, no, uh, there's no real discernible metrics that exist as of yet. Um, however, doing more research into specifically uh, looking at how can we establish some sort of impact assessment metric for peace tech would be a really cool field. Of Thank you for that question. Um, I would also like to add something to the question on, on human rights. I think that was um, a really important one because human rights, there 
legal norms, yes, completely, but they can also be um, morally justified. And um, I mean, there's we can also t even talk of uh, ethics of human rights. And I think this is important also because um, precisely so many companies that try to avoid talking about human rights and instead have their internal ethical guidelines or um, they would rather go for different ethical guidelines be precisely because human rights are legally binding. So um, if we say that human rights are not only legal norms, but they also can act as a minimal ethical standard for, for these new technologies, we're linking up the, um, the ethical or the moral with the legal. And that's actually the ideal case. I mean, legal norms should also be morally valid and moral norms that we think are can be justified, they should translate into legally binding law. They're not, they don't always overlap. I mean, you have moral laws that are not legally binding and you even have legal norms that from an ethical perspective can be very problematic. But ideally they would overlap. And um, I mean, precisely if we take into account all the structural violence that we're experiencing, it would really be important that we try to find an overlap between legal and mor moral norms that can be ethically justified. And I think there are few norms um, that are already um, like so universally accepted and that can, um, that can like act as a framework that we can already build on. Because if we start from scratch, it's going to be very complicated. I mean, <laughs> it's unlikely that we're going to find a new political uh, window of opportunity, so to say, as uh, there was after the Second World War. And um, even if we would agree on a new set of ethical guidelines or other norms, they would maybe not be as, um, as good even as the human rights norms. They might be like uh, softer and they might not be so, um, how to say, so much to the point. I would argue. So um, yes, of course, the legally binding norms, but that's exactly why uh, it would make sense to also consider them for ethical guidelines and not um, leave the open space to companies um, to saying, okay, we think this is ethical, other companies say, no, this is ethical, and then we have a huge discussion going on forever. Andrea, do you want to add something or yes, shall I close? No, oh. I just want to add something. Um, I mean, uh, Michele has mentioned that we had a, a big conference last uh, last week in Florence, where we it was very very useful to um, well to take into account uh, the 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 variety of uh, inter intersections existing between peace and tech. I think that now, and of course, we discussed about this information. We discussed a lot about dual use technology, and Access Now has, has worked a lot on that as well. Um, I think now that we broaden so much the concept. I think the, the, the further step is trying to narrow down the focus again because uh, uh, of course everything is uh, has to do with the conflict. This information of course has to do with conflict. Uh, uh, but uh, is conflict a necessary strict, um, strict link to, to peace and, and war? So that is a, a kind of an, an additional exercise that probably uh, or, I mean, at least I personally would like to, to reflect uh, a, a bit further. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, just uh, as a way of conclusion, um, the results of this, is, this discussion, as I said, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a new um, project that uh, started in December. Hopefully, will will we'll go on uh, for quite a while. Um, the discussion will be put together uh, on paper uh, on the the Global Peace Tech Atlas that we are discussing today. There are already two publications about uh, the mapping and the very, very idea of the Global Peace Tech uh, Hub, and both can be found at globalpeacetech.org. But the idea is also to collect um, for the Global Peace Tech Atlas um, contributions for all these different organizations working on peace, uh, including including Access Now uh, or working or working on on tech and and uh, tech for good. So these Global Peace Tech Atlas will have a conceptualization of what is peace tech and global peace tech and and, and all the questions that, that, that this this is raising in global affairs and and governance second a mapping of uh, the topic so uh, of everything related to peace tech and third uh, a, a wide list of case studies and examples of initiatives 
and uh, and also some some other contributions uh, that go more in depth into some of these initiatives. So this is of course the mapping. So it needs to be broad because it's a mapping. But uh, the part that you Andrea was talking about, and you were also mentioning like uh, uh, about narrowing it down, it's uh, I would say the next step. So from here, from this broad overview, we will try to to make sense out of this of everything that is peace tech that it also included the misinformation, disinformation and fighting disinformation. So an initiative, for instance, we have a European Digital Media Observatory here in Europe that is uh, fighting uh, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, it's it's considered part, part of peace tech. Uh, many organizations have done peace building as part of their peace build, digital peace building strategies. Uh, they've uh, constantly fought disinformation and tried to create uh, narratives that uh, were going against this disinformation. So now it is part of it, but as well as any other thing. So digital identities, for, for instance, as I was mentioning, early warning system, smart border control, satellites. So I will just point to the this global peace tech atlas they're putting together as a starting point for reflection. So we will not have answers, but we will have, we will have a clear overview of uh, everything that is out there where, where people are talking about peace tech and, and also what questions this raises for um, scholars uh, of global affairs um, and for regulation. So that's that's my conclusion. And of course, these faces that you see here, they are not like the... Uh, the only representatives of, of the initiative. So, of course, I'm just talking like uh, we're talking for us, but uh, of course, this is a very diverse group of people and each one will, will answer differently. So my invitation is to keep this uh, contact active, to connect with us uh, with more questions um, and also to discover who are uh, the, the other participants of the initiative and also to join the initiative. So to join the hub, to discuss with us how we can use and regulate technology uh, to achieve uh, peace. So thank you so much for attending this uh, session on uh, Global Peace Tech Atlas. And uh, uh, I wish all of you a good continuation of uh, Internet Governance Forum that, uh, if I'm correct, is starting today. So you have a great week ahead of you. So bye, have a nice afternoon, and, and see you soon.